Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, and I'm going to start reading at verse 24. This is what it says. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and burst against that house, and yet it did not fall. For it had been founded upon the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and burst against that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. The result was that when Jesus had finished these words, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Pray with me. Lord, this day use the power of your Spirit that our lives may be grounded, founded, standing in your power. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It was about a hundred years ago that the Japanese came to Frank Lloyd Wright, the famous American architect, and asked him if he would design the Imperial Hotel to be built in Tokyo. Well, he went to inspect the site, and he discovered something that surprised him. The soil was only about eight feet deep, and beneath that, it was just a slurry of mud. Well, he knew that the area was prone to earthquakes, and he knew for this building to stand that it was going to have to have a, a different kind of foundation, a foundation that would hold even in the middle of earthquakes. Well, a lot of people would have been discouraged at that point, but not Frank Lloyd Wright. He, he built this, this, this beautiful imperial hotel to withstand any size earthquake. And he made one more request that, that it have a, a, an oversized pool outside. He knew that whenever there was an earthquake, that a big part of the problem was is the earthquake broke the pipes. So fires spread and spread quickly. Fast forward. The year 1923, September of 1923, Tokyo, Japan had its worst earthquake in its history. Over 14,000, excuse me, over 140,000, 140,000 people died in that earthquake. They were slow getting news from Japan, so one of the newspapers had heard a rumor that Frank Lloyd Wright's building had fallen. They called Frank Lloyd Wright, and they said, we understand that among the, the many buildings that fell, your building fell and collapsed during the earthquake. Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright said, well, you can print that if you want to, but you need to be ready to print a retraction. The foundation of that building will withstand any earthquake. Well, shortly after that, news came from Japan. Frank Lloyd Wright's building was one of the few to have stood during the earthquake. Not only that, that the water from the pool that 
he had designed had been used to keep out fires and to keep them away from his building. Frank Lloyd Wright knew foundations. And that's what this morning's sermon is about. Foundations. Foundations that hold. Now, I'm not talking construction, and I'm not talking architecture. I'm talking about the words of Jesus. Here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 is, is, is filled with sayings of Jesus. If you ever want to know, you knew Jesus said something, but you don't know exactly where it is, try Matthew 5, 6, or 7 first. Because the Sermon on the Mount has so many of the, those things, including the Lord's Prayer, that, that go from beginning to end of it. Well, this is at the very end of it. And he gives a, a parable about the wise man who built his house upon the rock. This isn't a standalone parable. That the first words Jesus says are, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them, may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Therefore, therefore points to everything that's happened before it. I'm going to take a broad breaststroke this morning in talking about the Sermon on the Mount. The first thing that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount are the Beatitudes. Maybe the most familiar or among the most familiar words in in the whole of the New Testament. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That life is hard. That this life is so hard that sometimes it depletes our very spirit. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. Life is hard, but God is good. That even in in the hardest times of life that deplete our spirit, that... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. God's blessing is, is even there when, when life is hard, even when in mourning we're dropped to our knees, that God is good and God is there. For blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That even the most courageous. There are times in this life that they're drawn to meekness. That the air is just knocked straight out of us. But Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That God's blessing, the goodness of God comes even in the hard times, even in the difficult times. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. Life is hard, but God is good. In one of those chicken soup for the soul books, Dr. James C. Brown tells a story about one of his patients. His little boy named Bobby. Bobby was five years old. And when Bobby was four years old, he had contracted leukemia. He had been through all of the the chemotherapies for a year. His cancer was in remission, but... He knew what it was like to to get the chemotherapy, to be stuck in the back and poked and prodded. He knew what it was like to have the nausea that was brought on by the treatments. He knew what it was like to have the fatigue that was brought on by the treatments. Well, even though his cancer was in remission, he still was lined up for another treatment. He was there getting ready to be one more time poked and prodded. And he he turned to the technicians, the nurses, and to Dr. Brown there in the room. And he said, you don't need to hold me down. I've been through this before. I promise I won't move. And that's when he turned to Dr. Brown and he said, is it all right if I say the 23rd Psalm? Five-year-old Bobby began to recite the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. And he went on. Finally, after the procedure was finished, he turned to Dr. Brown and he said, it really didn't hurt that much. Well, Dr. Brown, the nurses and technicians knew that that wasn't the case at all. They knew that it must have hurt and that it hurt terribly. And that's when Bobby turned to Dr. Brown and he said, Do you know the 23rd Psalm? 
Dr. Brown said, yes, I do, as a matter of fact. And then Bobby asked, well, can you recite it? Dr. Brown said, oh, I think I can. And he said, let's hear it. So Dr. Brown began to recite the, the 23rd Psalm. He got to the end of it. It wasn't quite as, as sterling a, a, a job as, as what Bobby had done. And when he finished it, this is what Bobby said. He said, you know, you really should learn the 23rd Psalm by heart. Because when you say it out loud, God hears you and lets you know inside your heart that He is being strong for you when you can't be strong for yourself. That is a foundation that holds. That God is strong when we can't be strong for ourselves. That when Jesus rose from the grave, He became the, the good shepherd that leads us beside the still waters, even though that life around us is hard. Life is hard. Life is hard. But God is good. And that's a foundation that holds. That's the foundation that, that Jesus, the good shepherd, calls us to this morning. But that's not all. Second thing that I wanted to talk about this, this morning is that, well, you know, People are hard, but forgiveness is possible. I'm taking a broad breaststroke to the Sermon on the Mount, and in chapter 6, the tone of what Jesus says changes, and changes greatly. He begins to talk about hypocrites. Well, he doesn't take a light approach to talking about hypocrites. He talks about three things specifically about hypocrites. One, he uses the example of, of when they pray. The second one, he uses an example of when they give. The third, he uses the example of when you fast. And these gifts, these gifts that are given to us for, for giving praise to God, giving honor to God, giving thanks to God, and, and these gifts are given to us that are also used to, to help others as well. Well, it's the hypocrite that uses them rather than to, to shine the light on God, rather than to, to give honor and praise to God. They use it to shine the light on themselves. And they become, through their own self-interest, the center of attention. So it's in the middle of all this that Jesus gives his instruction on prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And in the center of that instruction on prayer that he says, pray this way. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That people are hard. People are hard, but there's, a, there's an opportunity for forgiveness. For forgiveness for, for you and me and for, for others as well. Joel grew up on a farm. He told several stories about growing up on a farm and it was um, one of those stories that he talked about his father on Saturdays would, would drive him to town. They had the afternoon to spend there in town, and, and then at 5 o'clock, he was headed back to the farm. Well, one afternoon, he asked his father, if, would it be all right if he stayed around to watch a basketball game that Saturday night, that he could get a ride home from a friend? His father said, sure, that would be fine. But at the end of the basketball game, Unfortunately, his friend forgot, left him there in town. Well, he had to start the long road, walk back to, to home, back to the farm. He lived on a, a, a long gravel road, and most everyone around him, that was the only road to get to their farms. So he thought it, he was in good luck when when he saw some lights coming behind him, he stuck out his thumb, knowing that it, it must be a neighbor and maybe they could give him a ride to, to his house. Pulled up, and when the window went down, his heart sank. It was Mr. Jim. Mr. Jim was the town character. He was born sour, and he had a relapse just about every day. He didn't find many nice things to say, and he was gruff. Well, he lived about two miles past where Joel lived, when he rolled down the window, Joel asked him, could I have a ride? 
Mr. Jim said, get in. He said, they didn't say anything all the way to Joel's house. And he stopped at the end of Joel's driveway. And when Joel got out, he said, thanks, Mr. Jim. I really appreciate the ride. And that's when he said it. That's when Mr. Jim said, thanks. What do you mean, thanks? Thanks is, is mighty poor pay. Well, Joel was so embarrassed. He didn't have any money. He said, well, Mr. Jim, I don't have any money. If I did, I'd pay you. But I really do appreciate the ride. He, and that's when he said it again. Thanks is mighty poor pay. And he drove on. Well, after that, Joel was embarrassed. Any time that he, he saw Mr. Jim, if Mr. Jim was on the sidewalk, he'd duck into the store. Any time that he saw Mr. Jim in a store, he would duck out onto the, the sidewalk. At the end of high school, Joel got a job. Through college, he, he worked, and he saved up enough to buy a car. And then when he entered seminary the next year, he was able to drive home. He drove home one weekend, and it was late at night. He was driving down that same gravel road to his farm when he saw a man walking by the side of the road. Well, you guessed it. It was Mr. Jim. He stopped, and he rolled down the window. He said, do you need a ride? Mr. Jim said, sure. He got into the car, and Joel drove past his farm the two or three miles out to, to Mr. Jim's house. He didn't stop at the end of the driveway. He drove all the way down the driveway to the house. And when Mr. Jim got out, he said, thanks, Joel, for the ride. Well, do you know what Joel said? Well, you know what Joel would like to have said. It's what we would all have liked to have said. The, 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 there's something on the inside of us that, that wants to get even. There's something on the inside of us that, that wants to set things right, to get things straight. There's something uh, on the inside of us that likes the idea of payback, that likes the idea of, of, of the tables being turned, of being able to, to, to move to the judge's side of the bench. But that's not what Joel did. Joel said, Sure, Mr. Jim, any time. Because Joel has a foundation that holds. It's a foundation that knows that people are hard, but forgiveness is possible. It's a foundation that understands that on the cross, what Jesus did for, for you and for me was he gave forgiveness. Forgiveness. And when he gave his life to forgive you and me, he didn't just say, and I'm gone. No, he rose from the grave on the third day to give you and me power we don't have. Power to receive that forgiveness and also power to forgive others as well. When we don't have that power, people are hard. But forgiveness is possible. That is a foundation that holds. That's Jesus Christ in your life and mine, the foundation that holds. But that's not all I wanted to talk about this morning. As I said, this is at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. And at the end, he, he points back to everything that's said with that word, therefore. And then he gives us this parable about the, the wise man who built his house on the rock, a foundation that holds. And in verse 28, he says, The result was that when Jesus had finished these words, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching. Multitudes. When the Bible talks about multitudes, very often it's talking about him feeding 5,000 or feeding 4,000. Thousands. Thousands were amazed. Thousands admired what Jesus had to say. Still, thousands, millions admire the things that Jesus said. But out of the thousands, there were but a handful of followers. Jesus doesn't call admirers. He calls followers. And that's the third thing that I want to talk about this morning. Foundation that holds is that Jesus calls followers, not admirers. Some of you may be familiar with the name Christopher Parkening. He 
one of the, the greatest classical guitar players in the world. He's played in orchestras. He's, he's even played at the White House for the president. But what you might not have known, that as well as being a, a world-class musician, classical guitarist, that Christopher Parkening was also world champion casting and fly fishing. A world champion in fly fishing and casting as, as well as a, a, a world-class guitarist. Well, the rest of the story, I'm going to tell in, in his words. He says, by age 30, I had achieved all my dreams in the musical world. But I was tired of the grinding schedule of hotel rooms, performances, and recording sessions. It was time to go fishing. With the money I'd earned, I found and purchased my dream stream on a ranch in Montana. I'd stopped playing the guitar. I called my record company and management group at Columbia and told them I had no desire to play anymore. I'd earned enough money from my music that I didn't need to work anyway. So for several years, I did everything I wanted. I learned every trout stream in the area and fished to my heart's content. But as time went by, I became very unhappy with my life. I don't know how to describe it, but my life became boring to me. It was totally empty. When you arrive at a point in your life where you have everything you've ever wanted, everything you thought would make you happy, and it still doesn't, then you start questioning things. I had the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and yet I thought, well, what's left? What's missing? While in California visiting friends, I attended a church where I heard a sermon entitled, Examine Yourself Whether You Are in the Faith. The preacher said that you could know all about Christ, know all about the Bible, even address Him as Lord, and Jesus might say to you, Depart from me, I never knew you. You never did the will of my Father. I was convinced if I had died that night, Jesus would have spoken those very words to me. Though my parents had introduced me to the Christian faith when I was young and thought I was baptized, and, and though I was baptized and read the, the Bible occasionally, I had never really done God's will. I suppose I wanted to be saved from hell, but I never wanted a Lord of my life that I should follow and trust and obey unconditionally. So I went home that day, broken over my selfish ways, and I prayed that Christ would be both Lord and Savior of my life. I surrendered the control of my life to Him. I developed a great hunger for the Word of God and started reading the Bible in earnest. Soon I came across a passage that said, Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. I realized there were only two things I knew how to do. Fly fish for trout and play the guitar. Well, I'm playing the guitar today absolutely by the grace of God. I have a joy, a peace, a deep down fulfillment in my life I never had before. My life has purpose. My desire is to glorify God and His Son, Jesus Christ, with my life and my music. The great composer J.S. Bach once said, The aim and final reason of all music is none else but the glory of God. In giving my life and my music over to God, I've learned firsthand the true secret of genuine happiness. Christopher Parkin discovered discovered the foundation that holds. And my question this morning, have you discovered that foundation that holds? Have you have you received Jesus as your Lord? And as your Savior, the Lord of your life, the one that you follow. Have you received George, Jesus as, as the Savior of your life? The one that you trust for the forgiveness of sin. It may be that you've never done that before. And this morning I want to pray, pray with you that, that you do that. Receive Jesus as Lord and Jesus as Savior. But it also may be that, that years ago you, you did pray to receive Jesus as your Lord and receive Him as your Savior, but you've gotten off the road. 
that you know that He's the foundation that holds, but you've not obeyed. It also may be this morning that He is your Lord. He is your Savior, and you've been following. Well, I want to invite you to pray along as well, that the Holy Spirit be received by all of us, that we know that foundation that holds, and we follow Him as Lord and as Savior. Pray with me. Jesus, you gave your life on the cross that we might know forgiveness, not one day, but this day. A forgiveness that only, that only you give and that we trust your forgiveness, that it's enough. Lord, I do believe that this morning there are folks that have never known that forgiveness and trusted you as their Savior. Maybe that there are folks that maybe trusted you at one time, but right now, that, that all the, the harsh and contentiousness of this life, that they've wandered away, and they've gotten caught up and distracted in this hard life, you've, not, you've never left them alone. I ask that you... You breathe on them the power of your spirit that this day they might receive that trust. Trust you as Savior. It also may be that there are those that maybe they, they trusted you at one time, but they never followed you as their Lord. Lord, you are the leader. And I ask that you breathe on us this day the power of your Holy Spirit that we become your follower not just admirers, not just amazed at the things that you said and the things that you did, but this day and all the days to come, we follow you as Lord and trust you as Savior. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life, and my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.